Hi. Hi. Are you Joe Banks? Yeah. Who are you? I'm the daughter of the guy who hired you, Angelica Graynamar. Oh, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Daddy told me to tell you that I don't know what he hired you for and not to tell me, that I'm totally untrustworthy. I'm a flibber to gibbet. Come on, let's get out of here. Hey everyone ever, and welcome to 20th Century Pop, the show where we try to understand the present while living in the past. My name is Tim Blevins. And I am Bob Canning, and Tim, yes, today, Bob. today we are not alone. No. I was going to say, it sounds like maybe we are. No, we have a special guest. We're jumping right into it, I guess. A uh, special guest, a repeat guest, someone who's been here Actually, I think you've been the you've guested more than anyone else on the show, and I think coming in second behind Bob. But other than that, no, you've been here uh, three times. Um, special guest, why don't uh, why don't I introduce you and and we'll get this going because that already feels awkward. Jarf Hardeen. <laughs> How's that? Jarf Hardeen. <laughs> Am I totally mispronouncing everything? <laughs> Uh, well, thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's just Jeff Harden. Oh, God. Okay. You gave me a little bit of extra flair. I it, like it. Oh, it doesn't feel I'll like... Cons- okay. I'll consider using that. You but- can. It's Lean into it if you do. I, I don't know why... I, have I done that before when you've been on the show? Have I mispronounced your last name? Which I only ever read, to be honest. So I'm, apparently I'm reading it with that sort of a slanted E in it. Well, words that you only read can be awkward the first time you try to pronounce them. I spent many years of my life thinking hors d'oeuvres was pronounced hors d'oeuvres. I feel like there's a cartoon character who does that, so that probably didn't help you to hear Daffy Duck or whoever referred to them as hors d'oeuvres. No, Daffy Duck was no help there. No, which is a shock. Normally great with grammar. Um, Tim, when you you first met me, you you said, hi, nice to meet you, Bobé, Bobé. which I thought was a little weird. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's true. We met at Emerson College. That's right. And I could run with this, but I'm not going to because I think it would it would sound forced, actually, is what it was. But yes, Jerf, thank you for being on the show. You you do a lot of podcasts. You do your own podcasts, and you guest on other podcasts, too. Is that correct? That's right. I really love guesting. I've done a bunch of guesting on Movies by Minute podcasts. Mm-hmm. So just in case your listeners aren't familiar with the format, Movies by Minute are just like it sounds, taking a movie you love and covering it one minute of the film at a time. Started out with Star Wars Minute, and it's grown to... If there's a movie that you love, there's a pretty good chance that there is a Movies by Minute podcast about it. There's over 100 at this point, so you can go to moviesbyminute.com and see if there's one already there or one in the works. Um, Jarf, Jarf had recommended um, a topic for today's episode that ties into a podcast um, that you have coming up. We're doing a segment today called How Did I Miss This? Um, it's a segment, Bob, that you proposed a, a month or two back. And it, it's, it's Bob and I talk a lot about pop culture from the 80s and 90s and things that meant a lot to us. And every now and then it feels like something slipped through the cracks of what we had. There might be something that everybody's a fan of, like Jaws or Bruce Springsteen, which we, for some reason, did not partake in. Or it might be a movie that we were probably aware of, that, but we never quite caught, you know, didn't see or didn't impact us. And so it'd be curious, as we're doing today, to talk to someone who one of these things did impact and see why did we miss it? How did it impact you? And, and Jarf, you had suggested today's topic, which is the 1990 uh, John Patrick Shanley film with Tom Hanks and, 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 and uh, Meg Ryan, uh, Joe versus the Volcano. And you mentioned it because as you were just about to say, so please continue, you, you have a podcast coming up about this, correct? I have been thinking for a while after having the fun of guesting on Movies by Minute podcast, what would be the right movie to do as my own for the first time? And I just, I had a feeling that it would be a good match with Tierney. And so I reached out to her. It turns out it's her favorite movie. Joe so, versus the Volcano is her favorite movie? Joe versus the Volcano is her favorite movie. And she's already done a couple of Movies by Minute podcasts. She did Return to Oz Minute, about the 80s sequel to Wizard of Oz, and she did Never Ending Minute, 
about the never ending story. And so she's already got that experience. And, and now we're going to cover Joe versus a volcano. Which was a movie you were familiar with. This is something you know. Yes. So I was introduced to it not right when it came out. I was introduced in college. So I went to Lock Haven University, as we've talked about a couple of times on the Cosmic Geppetto podcast. And there were only a very small number of punks at the school. It was a small school, and you could count all the punks in one hand. Did you count and, yourself amongst that hand, on top of that hand? Yes, I'm counted on on that hand. <laughs> that sounds weird. I don't know. Well, that's how a lot of people do their counting. I mean, we could also say, are you on that abacus? You could say that. <laughs> it's uh, uh, Again, with the flair. But uh, one one of the fellow punks of Lockhaven said that Joe vs. Volcano was his favorite movie. And so... I just thought, okay, Scott McDonald, he, he's got some cool tastes. And I guess that was my how did I miss this moment. And so so I checked it out, and I've just really loved it ever since. Did you know about it beforehand? Like, did you do you remember it coming out, remember it being released? It's, I was tangentially aware of it, and I – had probably seen the previews for it, but it's, I this is that hard to imagine pre-internet age. So I had never read anything about it, and I just knew that it was a movie with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, and I knew the basic premise, and and I was a fan of Tom Hanks, but it was just one of those I, I hadn't gotten around to seeing it. Did you did you have like a, a sense that it was a, a comedy, a romantic comedy, a fantasy film, or anything like that, or was it just really a blank slate? I got the sense that it was. A quirky comedy. And what did quirky comedy mean in the 90s? Because I think that is something that I also saw this in the commercials. But at that point of your life, what did quirky mean? If something's going to be a quirky, off-kilter comedy. Well, that's probably why I was slow to take it up. Because from the marketing, I got the sense that it was like a run-of-the-mill quirky comedy. Like your, your basic high concept silly situation with some likable actors movie and and once i saw it i realized it is that but it's a really good version of those tropes with really great performances and and, and a lot it really pays off multiple viewings because there are neat Easter eggs worked in there and and more thematic elements that, than you would expect from something silly like that. I get a sense – yeah, I mean, I – this was my first time watching the movie from start to finish. Um, do you remember as, Do you remember it coming about. out? Like have you – did uh, you see I, it? Yeah, I remember coming out. I remember thinking it was a movie I wanted to see. Um, I felt like I was a Tom Hanks fan and when I got around to think, you know, I didn't see it again. I didn't see it in the theaters when it came out. Um, I thought about seeing it, you know, three or four years later is when I kind of realized, um, who Tom Hanks was and, and became a fan of his. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking about between you and I, Tim, that this is something we missed. I was aware of it. I didn't really miss it to the point where I even rented it and started watching it. And I didn't have, at that time, I didn't have the patience for it because it didn't turn out to be, it didn't start the way I expected it to with more laughs, some quirkiness, some comedy. I mean, it opens pretty darkly, really. And for me, expecting one thing and not getting it right away and just, you know, being such a busy guy, I just didn't have time to sit through it. And uh, that is why, I, until this past week, uh, I had never seen the entirety of Joe versus the Volcano. Sounds like we all had a similar thing where the trailer, it was quirky, it was Tom Hanks. I mean, looking at when this came out, Meg Ryan was coming off of When Harry Met Sally. Tom Hanks, I, I loved at the time from, you know, I was 14 when this movie came out. I loved him from Dragnet. I knew him from Big. But none of us were kind of drawn to it. Real quick, just in case the listeners don't uh, aren't aware of it, Jeff, what is like a one or two sentence summation of what this movie is? I know that there's a lot going on in it, but basically, what's, the, what's at the heart of what this movie's about? 
So the heart of it is Joe is a guy who he's lost. He's too scared to live his life. He's also a hypochondriac. And he's convinced that he's going to die. And he's offered the opportunity to really go out like a hero by jumping into a volcano to appease an angry god. So the movie is his journey to get to this island and an allegory for him facing his fears, finding love. Now it's sounding kind of pithy when I give it (laughs) that over. But I think that's how it looked. I mean, I think the commercials made it look kind of pithy. Again, because you're coming off of romantic, for me anyways, coming off of romantic comedies with these two characters, these two actors, Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, that's how I saw them. I think that's how it was presented. So like Bob, like you were just saying, that start this movie, it does start, the tone of this movie threw me, because I had not seen it before either. It starts out really dark, I think, very depressing, very gloomy, very gray. And very surreal. Like this is this is a not to just throw that word around, but this is a surreal movie. It takes place in a reality that isn't our reality. Would you would you both agree with that? Or um, I certainly agree with that at the beginning. I I think the tone and and the look of it changes a bit midway, where it sort of changes from being this uh, uh, different reality to our reality, which sort of threw me a little bit as I was watching it, and then it changes again to being uh, an unrealistic sort of world again towards the end, um, which I'm not sure if that was intended. But yeah, like the the beginning, it's it's very much like set pieces. And, and stage settings and just the, the look of it is almost like it's sort of futuristic, but not really. It's like it's it's a world that doesn't quite exist. You recognize a lot of it, but it doesn't quite exist. This uh, this place where he works, where we spend most of the uh, opening of the movie. Yeah, it's very industrial. It's, it's a little bit like Brazil or a little dystopian future looking, I guess. I, I will be honest. And, and Jeff, I'm going to say this now. This was a hard movie for me to get into. I it, There was a part where suddenly I turned and, and, and really started enjoying it. But I have to say, at the beginning of this movie, I had trouble now getting into it. I, I just – something about the pace or the feel – because, again, it wasn't what I was expecting. I didn't know quite what to expect. But, it, I mean, it starts out, yeah, like, um, like very sci-fi feeling almost. And it's very symbolic and it's very – theatrical i mean the the author is is a playwright i believe john patrick shannon is am I getting the name right john patrick who wrote the movie shanley Mike? shanley yes. no and i have the flair shanley shanley it's it's <laughs> john patrick shanley's show <laughs> I, I think the movie starts i don't know there's something i, I was never a huge coen brothers fan not because i, I don't like them just because i hadn't seen a lot of their movies and at this point in my life i wouldn't have known them very well but this movie the when it started off i'm like this feels a little bit like a Coen Brothers impersonation, or it felt because of what I was expecting, it felt a little bit like you. It's aware at the beginning of how off it is, how quirky. Everyone has very like Tom Hanks has a lot of monologues. These are like performance pieces. Darren Hedaya plays his boss, and he's ranting and raving into this phone. It's very stark and experimental, and. Because, again, I don't think of Tom Hanks as, at this point at least, as this this character of despair. And I don't think of Tom Hanks as existing in this unreal world. I had trouble with the start. Do you remember when you first saw it, Jeff, or you pulled in from the beginning? Do you like, did you like the opening to this movie when you sat down to watch it? I did like the opening. And the way that I look at it uh, is that that stylized ultra dreary work scene is Tom Hanks's character's experience of work. So it's, that's the kind of stylized I like when it's not stylized for the sake of pizzazz, but to, to show the kind of emotional experience of the character. So 
in the first seconds of the movie, he steps out of his car and just steps into a disgusting mud puddle. And he's just dragging ass into this long line into work. and With everyone else. With everyone else. Yeah. And it's very gray and dreary. And so, so I liked it, but I do get why it is a left turn from what you would expect and and takes a little bit to get into but is that because of that and so I'm curious what was the point where you did start to get into it well sure um I think and Bob I think this ties into what you were saying with the two different worlds um as the movie progresses uh the movie's kind of marked each of the I guess acts of the film are marked by Meg Ryan playing a different character Meg Ryan plays three characters in the movie the first is a co-worker of Tom Hanks with like this dark gothic mat of hair on her head who's you know sounds a little like New Yorky or something and she's kind of a quiet mousy kind of person when Tom Tom Hanks's character goes through this whole thing I know we're jumping through the plot a little bit um but eventually he he gets diagnosed with this I think it's called a brain cloud. He gets diagnosed with a disease that's uh, symbolic for depression and he's advised to go and try to do something, you know, do, you know, live up, live your life, live it to a full, to the fullest. And this mysterious benefactor comes out of the woodworks and says, I want you to jump in a volcano for me and I'll pay you all this money for this. And, and there's a whole backstory behind it. At that point, when the plot kind of kicks in, cause we know it because of the title, Tom Hanks goes into the city of New York or, or, no, he goes, or does he go to California? Where does he meet red-haired Meg Ryan? That's that's when the movie really turned on for me, when Meg Ryan plays her second character. Yeah, that's getting, in California. In California, thank you. We're getting sort of this skewered look at, it's a brighter looking scene too, but we're getting sort of a skewered look of of the city, of a city, of a faster paced lifestyle. And that looked like a 90s comedy to me. That played like L.A. Story. That played like... I'm blanking on titles right now, but when Harry Met Sally, which is an 80s comedy, that played very smart, hip, kind of fast talking. And I love Meg Ryan as that red haired character. I think there's a lot to her. And I feel like the movie does a tonal shift. And I think it becomes a little, that middle part, strangely, is the least visually interesting. I think the it's bookended by two far more visually interesting points. But something there, maybe it's just because I was ready to, you know what it is? I think. And I'm flashing back at this point. I don't think I can accept Tom Hanks as depressed. And I think that I, I was going to ask you, and I, before you asked me where the turning point was, at the start of the movie, when you see this guy trudging through the mud, is Tom Hanks the actor you want to see doing that? Like, is, are you both cool with Tom Hanks in the lead of this movie? Oh, yeah. I think so. Yeah, I think so, too. Especially now. Like, maybe that's part of why I didn't get into it back then. Because maybe, like you were saying, my my history with Tom Hanks was lighthearted comedies uh, and cross-dressing. And so... From Bosom Buddies? Yeah. And so, yeah. N- you know, years, decades since, he's gone through loads of roles and I've gone sure. through loads of changes myself. And so it's it's much easier, I think, now, just seeing the movie for the first time now, it was easy to accept him in the role. Um, and also, just as a little side note, um, I know we're kind of moving through the movie, but it also helped that it opened with Once Upon a Time. And so I... Oh, did you like that? I I was transported, you know, and accepting of the fact that this isn't quite reality. And I think that also kind of helped it. Yeah, I had trouble navigating the start. I... Jeff, did you like Tom Hanks before you saw this movie? Were you a fan of him in the late 80s, early 90s? Or was he not on your radar? He was on my radar. I I was a fan of his, especially big. So... We can put a plug in here to your earlier episode where you did a deep dive into a big and and how very creepy parts of it are when you look back on it and and the whole relationship with the, what's our Elizabeth Perkins? Yeah, That's right. I think you could say four fifths of big is very very disturbing, and one fifth of it takes place on a giant piano. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a, but but going back to something that you said a little bit ago, so. Meg Ryan in the role of the the three characters and Patricia is the second Meg Ryan that we meet. That's my favorite character too. Yeah. And Angelica. uh, Patricia's the last Meg Ryan. Yep. Yep. So Angelica is, Angelica is the poet. And when, so when I decided to do 
the Joe versus the minute, it had been a minute since I'd seen the movie. And so when, when I just thought back on things that I loved about it, the first thing I would always think of is Meg Ryan saying, I'm a flippity gibbet. Yeah, right? That that is just what stuck in my mind for all of these years and I I loved how over the top she is in that character and now on a rewatch I have a lot more appreciation for the first Meg Ryan character Dee Dee. Her, her facial expressions and comedy acting are just off the charts in that super shy mousy secretary and, and I like the the voice that she puts on to it too so it's a, the, this whole I I've always been obsessed with this idea of like multiple characters and so I like it when people play what like dual roles or triple roles in this case it feels like the multiverse to me. So that's, <laughs> and, and that's, uh, Tierney and I like to do these kind of come up with fan theories as we're looking more closely at movies. And I've just always been curious where Dee Dee fits in because Patricia and Angelica are supposed to be half sisters, which of course is a joke in the movie because they're identical. So, how, but they don't, there's no explainer to how Dee Dee ties in. And, and oh, it's because I, it's supposed to be like, I guess they were the two that were fated to be each other, fated to be together or something like that. And, and so with each relationship, they get closer and closer to making it work. And I don't know exactly how I feel about that, honestly. But like the, the the progression of the love story part. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. No, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I don't like the fact. I get. I, I I like the idea of the three characters played by by one actress, and I like the idea that it is a progression of relationships uh, for Tom Hanks from one to the other. And for me, it doesn't quite work. And and you're struggling with it too. I think it doesn't quite work because uh, Angelica and Patricia are related. I think it'd be a lot easier to explain it and understand it and and follow that path if there wasn't a relationship between those two characters and if those two characters never had that scene together uh, where they talk to each other. Um, because then it just, to me, is, is a better... Um, it, it just kind of evolves better if they're not... Because it adds something more to their relationship because they're half-sisters and because they have the same father. And it, it changes the way you think about the plot a little bit. And I wish they hadn't been related in any way. Yeah, because it, p- it plays a little bit like on, on kids' cartoons or, or on sitcoms you watch. Sometimes you get that episode where the main character of, of the show is telling a story. And then they show the version of the story and it's characters, you know, from the shows playing like it's, you know, it's like Alex P. Keaton's going to learn how the Declaration of Independence was signed. And so he has he tells that story and it's all the cast members of his show playing like John Adams and William Williams and all these people. So you're 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 taking people they know and putting them into the roles. And I say this because the, the fact that a choice was made that Meg Ryan's in it is to me the most fascinating thing about the movie is that the choice was made that Meg Ryan plays these three characters. Two of them are kind of connected, but there's a progression. They do break up the plot. And thinking about this idea that Tom Hanks at the beginning gets diagnosed with what he calls the, the brain cloud. I mean, if this whole movie is the final thoughts, you know, if this is the meditation on death in a way, if this is the meditation on how we accept death, maybe, because that is why he's going to the volcano. If he's a dying man and these are the last thoughts he's having, he, he's having these these flashes, these frenzied flashes through life of kind of acceptance of death going from the, 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 the dreariness of where he works to sort of bizarro, sort of desperate, buy everything, wear everything, meet this, this crazy person who doesn't make sense, and then finally meeting the person he's comfortable with and jumping to the volcano. I, I like this progression. And I think, like Bob, like you were saying, if they weren't all, con- if they weren't connected, and it's just the same face each time. I mean, Meg Ryan becomes like an angel of death or a harbinger or something in the movie. It's talking about it now. Yeah, I, I actually like, is Dee Dee the first one, Jeff? Is that correct? Dee Dee's the first one. That's yeah. right. 
she was the one I won. I didn't know that was Meg Ryan at first. I saw Amanda Plummer's name in the credits. I thought, is that Amanda Plummer? No, she comes in later. I, yeah, I, Amanda Plummer's in for, she's literally just a cameo, right? Yes. And Carol Kane is literally someone who happened to be on set the day they were filming and she's in it, which I found very weird too. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. I, the Meg Ryan part of this is far more fascinating to me than the Tom Hanks part for some reason. To the point that my the the scene in the middle where she has red hair, my favorite sequence, that's almost not. You could almost remove that. Like I don't know exactly how that impacts the story, but I love it. I do love that there's something going on in this movie with those three characters, and I like that it's not explained. It's not gimmicky. It's not. I don't know if it was written for with the idea that whoever performer plays that character will play all three, but. I think it works. I think there's a lot of range to Meg Ryan that she doesn't get credit for with anymore, I feel like. But um but I what- agree. That's why I love the DD performance so yeah. much. It's um be- because she she didn't get once she became America's sweetheart and and really was cemented in how she how she looks and how she acts when she's in the third Meg Ryan, the Patricia role. That is a familiar Meg Ryan. That's that. that, Yeah. That's, that's Hollywood's Meg Ryan. And so they didn't really cast her in like make a goofy, awkward face and be super mousy. And and so she's so good at the full range of that. That's kind of a shame. And I wonder if that's why I didn't see this movie then. I mean, I, I, because the you know I watched some commercials, I watched some trailers, and they're playing up the Meg Ryan from the end of the movie. And again, that's a fine enough character. I mean, there are some strengths to her as a character. She's the captain of the ship and all those things. But that last part plays so romantic comedy like that. I think that's what people were expecting. That I can imagine, you know, a lot of people probably went to this movie on a date night. A lot of people probably went to this movie looking for when Harry met Sally. Because you know, I I tend to forget sometimes that that movie. I mean, I know it's huge, but she was huge. She was the biggest star for a few years in the 90s. I've seen actually very few Meg Ryan movies when I stopped to make a list. Um, Inner Space, now this, and When Harry Met Sally. But it's like, I can see why the first two-thirds of this movie would have turned an audience not off because it's not enjoyable, but off because the expectancy and the way it's presented is here's your romantic comedy. And yet you've got that title. You have a title, Joe versus the Volcano, that's telling you this is whacked out. I don't know why that didn't get me to see it, to be honest. So I'm reading the the Shanley screenplay right now. Mm-hmm. So to answer your question, was it intended that the same actress would play all three roles? The answer is yes. So that's that's made explicit in the screenplay. And I think... Reading that, you see more clearly why Angelica is important to the story. So the the story is the redheaded one, correct? Yes, exactly. Okay. Angelica's the flippity gibbet. Yes. So thank you. the the movie I think is only interested in Joe's journey and his interior life. So everything the three Meg Ryans do are just about Joe. Um, so it, when he goes on his date with Dee Dee, she, they almost get together and then she shies away. And so the whole, the whole point of Angelica is she's the bridge in, in getting a little bit closer because and and I don't know if it 100 percent comes across in the movie, but in the screenplay they talk about like there's a little bit of swell of music and it's almost like something magical is going to happen, but then but then she, she like teeters on the point of bravery and then she backs down. No, no, no. So, I think in the movie, if I'm remembering it correctly, um, she offers to come up to to wherever Joe is staying, and mm-hmm. Joe's the one that says, "No, that, that's okay. I think I'm going to." you know, st- be alone tonight uh, as he was preparing for his journey. So um, where Dee Dee backed off, Angelica was was ready to, to make that connection. And then Joe at that point didn't seem ready. Do you guys care about Joe? 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How, how can you not feel for Joe? Are you dead inside? Well, I am a little dead inside. <laughs> dead inside. Um, a bit. No, I and I I know it's his story, but again, because we're talking about this part right now, the Angelica character, this red-haired Meg Ryan character, was so fascinating to me. The fact, and because there's something desperate about the, she tells him I'm an artist, but she also knows. We're only my art's only up because my father owns this restaurant. There's that scene. There's the the my funniest part and the part that I actually laughed the hardest at was when she tells her poem and says, Do you want to hear it again? And she says her poem again. To me, there's so much in all of that where I'm like, this character is that tragic person who gets off on saying I'm an artist without really having to do the work, which I think I relate to that. <laughs> and I think because when Joe's there, and this is weird for a Tom Hanks role, because Tom Hanks is a talented actor. I feel like Tom Hanks fades to the background during her scenes. I was so drawn to her, and I was so focused on her. And when she said goodbye, I'm like, well, that's good. You you know, you don't want to overuse a character. But I was also like, come back or go back, Joe. I see where this is going now with Meg Ryan, and I'm not sure I – or with the third Meg Ryan, the blonde Meg Ryan. I'm like, I just – that – I don't know, because, again, I – what you're saying now with it being intended makes me think there is more importance to it. But I just feel like that middle part of the film, while I enjoyed it the most, I, d- I didn't really see the movie hinging around that. Because before and after it, Joe Joe has already made his decision to do what he's going to do. Mm-hmm. He's physically tra- – like it's that's why I had forgotten earlier there in California. He goes from New York to California to the boat. And I'm like, well, he's already made the decision to go. Like, that was the thing that was odd to this. I'm like, there's a couple of times where I'm like, there's too many, for this surreal world, this exaggerated world, there might be too many complexities to Joe. Apparently, he was a firefighter at one point. Apparently, he was very brave at one point. We never see that. We just start him at his drudge, drudge job. And it's like, either we should see that or, or let's maybe not have that there. Because isn't there more drama to a story of someone who has always been the schlubs and like thinks they're dying and finds the ability to do something in ultimately dying? He's going to do a great thing for this Hawaiian island. And I don't know if we're going to spoil the end of it or not, because I find something very funny with what happens in that too. But he's going to do this great thing by dying. <laughs> Like, that's his arc without the firefighter part. Having him be a firefighter who do put their lives on the line and who are valiant because they're willing to die changes. Like, he's already had that realization once in his life before. Yeah, there's a couple things like that for me that that sort of don't quite make the movie work for me. And that was one of them. Like, um, when it started, and, and you could presume that this has just been his path in life and he's gotten to this point and you don't know about the firefighter thing. I was I was interested to see where it was going. And there was um, a part where I think it was Dan Hadea's character, uh, when he was talking to him about how he doesn't feel good, he says to him, and I wrote this down, nobody feels good after childhood. And I thought that that was kind of, you know, a, a bit of a mission statement of the movie um, to talk about how everyone has their problems and everyone has said these these dead end jobs and and this this thing and then Joe is the one that's going to get out of it. He's going to find a way to change that. Um, but then you learn that well, he wasn't always like this. He was in a better place at some point, and something happened to him that that made this happen. Then that sort of complicates it, like you were saying, Tim. Um, and well, so uh, I have to I have to start thinking about it differently at that it's point. Another, it's another thing to think about. Maybe that's what complicates it. I don't know if it's needed or not. I mean. Do you so Jarf, when you first saw this, when you went back to see it again, did the did that part stick out? Like did you remember he had that whole fireman? Like do you find the fact that he was a fireman is important to the plot? Because I might be missing something with that. But is that key to him as a character? So a couple of things. I it wasn't something that I remembered in particular. And so it it didn't stand out on a rewatch. I thought that it made sense that they use it as the explanation for why he is a hypochondriac. And so they're, they were talking about post-traumatic stress disorder and resulting anxiety. And so I think that I think those are good things to talk about. And I think that it it, it was a suitable explanation. But I do I do see how by the time it comes up in the movie, it feels out of nowhere. 
but it doesn't throw me off. It doesn't make the character not make sense anymore. It's, I, I think it kind of ties into the theme of him being too scared to live his life. And so like he's had trauma in the past and now he, he has anxiety as a result and, and he's just dragging himself through life because he can't fully embrace it. So, but I, if this was a more traditional movie, there would be there would be scenes of him. It would start out with him as a firefighter, and then his partner would get killed in the line of duty, and then five years later, and now he's in a crummy job. That's true, and that's the expectation. That that would be the expectation, and maybe that's why that's so jarring because this movie isn't yeah it's 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 backstory that the author probably had and it helps write the character but in the world we're given we're given such a or at least i think such a cartoonish world which is good yeah that kind of detail i don't know if this is the movie where you look at where you take a direct clinical look at post-traumatic stress i don't know if this is the movie where you look at even the fact that he's a hypochondriac part of me is like I see this movie just about, especially at the beginning when he steps in the the puddle and how great it is. It's like, it's not so much that we're worried about dying. It's just how depressing it is to live. Like this guy has nothing to even live for until he gets the opportunity to kill himself. So like, I don't even know if he needs to be a hypochondriac. I, I, cause I feel like I am a hypochondriac, but I, I, what I related, I think in him at the beginning was just that feeling like I've been at the job before where it feels like you're just walking in a straight line like a machine to your doom. And that's part of why I had trouble watching this. It's just sad. It's like it's it's it obliterates me to think about jobs like that. And I get that. And that, again, it's like maybe streamlining it, but that's not the story anybody wanted, I guess. People I think wanted this thing to be a romantic comedy like Jeff, it is a movie you, you like a lot. Do you find yourself showing this to other people? Is this a movie you encourage, like you encouraged me to watch it? I had never seen it before. Do you have a repeated experience of showing this to people? Well, that's what the podcast is going to be. So I, I, of course, want to talk with other fans of the movie, mm-hmm. but I really love talking to people who are seeing it for the first time and and hearing fresh perspectives on it so so, um, i well you're welcome (laughs) (laughs) um, and and I, i agree it is sad i i am realizing through this conversation that that is part of why i like it sad and magical is just that that is my jam so it, it's it, it's in a similar way to why I like sad music. It feels relatable, and it makes me feel happier. Yeah, it reminded me of uh, a movie I saw more often um, back in the '90s. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it—the Robin Williams movie Toys. Mm. I have not seen it. That's another one I have not seen. Maybe we should do that one. Yeah, I love that movie. Oh, you do? I mean, I haven't seen it since the 90s. I watched it, like, f- for an entire summer. I, I really enjoyed it. And it's it's the same kind of thing where it's not a real world. Mm-hmm. And you think it's going to be this joyful, fun movie because of toys and Robin Williams. Um, and there's just such a dark side to it and such a sadness to it. Um, and it's, and it, it's also magical. Yeah. Uh, much like this movie is... And I think that's part of why I, I had some, some struggle with this movie is because the beginning has the magical moments and the staged appearance and the stylistic, and the end does. The middle part, where he's in the real world, basically, he's in the city, he's, he's no longer on soundstage sets, but he's in a restaurant somewhere uh, or driving along the streets. Um, it, it just kind of throws me because I love the symbolism. I love the very clear symbolism of him losing his soul right at the beginning, oh, the soul, the soul of his shoe. That's in the trailer, I like, and I winced at that because it's, uh, it's so well, I, but, verbatim the feeling. But because it's the once upon a time fairy tale, yeah, um, I think it works. I like that it works. You, you get it right away what's going on, and then you can enjoy all the other things that happen throughout that that tie into it. I the 
uh, logo for the medical company he works for is like this lightning bolt shape that is uh, comes up in the logo, but it's also the path that he has to walk to get to work. And then you see it a couple other times throughout the movie in his uh, initial apartment. He's got a big rip down the side of his wall that's just falling apart. It's in the shape of that um, logo. And then at the end, when you get a long shot of the tribe climbing up the volcano and you see their torches on a certain path, that's in the shape of of that logo. And yeah, I like I like that about this movie, how there's things to look for, symbolism and, and just Easter eggs throughout, like Jarf, I think you mentioned early on in this uh, episode. It makes me glad that it predates massive use of computer effects, because I think they would have CGI'd some of that symbolism beyond recognition if that was the case. Like they had to physically make those people walk in the line and they had to make these sets. And I like that. I think it could have been overdone, maybe. But I do see what you're saying. I actually, and this contradicts what I just said four words ago, I almost wanted the movie to be more Tim Burton or more like almost have the visuals be a little more like Willy Wonka, a little, not the Tim Burton. Even a little, little bit more over the top. Maybe just to, to because. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I did too, especially in that middle, middle section. Oh, see, where I think he, that would make the middle section work well. Cause we know what Tom Hanks looks like in a car. We saw him in big, get out of that hatch top. I like that middle realism thing. Because he has to leave his world. Normally, you're stepping into the fantastic world at the point. He leaves, leaves this disgusting, hyper-real German expressionist nightmare of a smokestack into the world. And again, in 1990, I wouldn't have known because I didn't live in a city. But into this world that is bright and familiar. And then he goes on his pre-castaway sail, which is a its own little thing. And I know we haven't even gotten to the end yet because I almost feel like – I don't know. Does this feels like three very, as movies are, the three acts are very separate pieces. Then they have visual cues, which I'm understanding more now. Do you guys like the end of this movie? The getting to the island, the stuff on the island, Abe Vigoda as the leader of the island? Um, I'm okay with it. I, again, I, I feel like I haven't connected to the movie the way I was supposed to. You know, I, I get what was trying what it was trying to do. It was, you know, um, observation on death, but also on life. And and I wanted to connect to it more. I wanted to have like a, a strong reaction to what whatever happens when he jumps or doesn't jump into the volcano. And it didn't quite connect with me when they got shot right back out. To, to spoil um, the ending, everyone. We should probably <laughs> say spoiler. But can we talk about that spoiler. for a minute? Yeah, we can talk about that. Okay. How do you, how do you, so Bob, I, I, you didn't quite feel like you got meaning from that. Is that right? Yeah, I, I didn't. Um, and I, I, I feel like I'm the problem here. Like, I feel like it's, it probably does a good job of trying to express what it's, what it's trying to express. And, and I just didn't quite catch it. Well, Jarf, what about you? Do you like the ending to this film? Well, first I want to say, I don't love how they depict native people in this sure. movie. It's so, so well, problematic. they are, they are uh, like Nordic slash Jewish slash Polynesian. Right. So it's, it's not exactly, I think that's, that, they didn't really want to uh, pinpoint these folks as Polynesian natives. They're, they're quite a, an interesting mix. And, and I'm so curious, I'm so curious why they, why they made that decision, and so I think that's something that we'll <laughs> we'll dig into what when we get into the final act of the movie on the podcast. It's but in terms of how do I like how the movie ends, the I am lukewarm about the island scene generally, but I do like what happens after they got shot out of the volcano. So yeah. they, they, cause they think they're going to drown. And then it pulls back that, the super luggage that they got. And it's the steamer that, trunks. The, the uh, steamer all of this trunks. out of context makes no sense. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. We didn't talk uh, about that scene. It's, it, it, and it's an example of one of the things I like about the movie. It's, a very short scene where he goes to buy his luggage for the trip. And 
I'm sorry I don't remember the actor's name, but he just gives this really standout melodramatic performance where he's hyping up these steamer trunks and and they're and he's oh you're going on a real journey let me take you to this back room and then he opens up the door and magical music swells and and so it, it's a nice payoff when those steamer trunks miraculously bob out of the water yeah it, it's it, uh, of course it doesn't make any sense what was holding them down, and then suddenly they shoot out at just the right moment. That's uh, true, but, too. <laughs> but I just... But that's, that's the magic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I, I need to learn to embrace the magic. But I like that it's, oh, okay, it's a miracle we're saved. They, they you know, get on the steamer trunks as a raft, and so then finally Tom Hanks is starting to have some hope, and then he starts to go down his pessimistic path again. And he says, well, we are out here in the middle of the ocean with no food or supplies. And, and Meg, Ryan's, Meg Ryan's character says, it's always going to be something with you, Joe, isn't it? And so I just like how, I like how their dynamic lands more so than like, the silliness with the volcano. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I liked with the volcano, only because I'm like, this is the angle of the movie, and this is why I think maybe it's a fever dream and didn't really happen. All those characters die. <laughs> that 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 <laughs> island sinks. All of those, all of those, the people living, the native to that island, uh, the Abe Vigoda, no more Nathan tribal Lane, Nathan Lane. They're dead, <laughs> and nobody cares. Nobody comments. Right. And I'm like, I think that's okay in this movie. Because that's, I think this movie is dark, could be dark enough to do that. What the, what, and I get, we're getting the happy ending where they're floating and it's always something with you, Joe, and that's fine. The, what, the, what the movie does that I think is a disservice to itself, the one, and so, a single line. And I think it, in a way, it, I don't know why this line is in there. They make it a point of saying that the doctor, at the beginning, and we didn't talk about this, and I think we're out of time, but the doctor that, uh, Tom Hanks' character saw is played by Robert Stack, who diagnoses him with the brain cloud. We find out at the end that that doctor is Meg Ryan's father's, who is the... Oh, there's a lot we haven't talked about. This. <laughs> we find out that that doctor's a quack, that he's actually not a good doctor, and that it was all manipulated to get Joe to go to this thing to throw himself in the volcano. And the sheer existence of it's like, oh, this was all just a setup to do this thing... This ridiculous thing to do is a real thing. The ridiculous diagnosis you had is not a real thing. That undermines a little bit of the surrealness of the movie to me. Because honestly, I really, I had a brief second of thinking, oh, they're going to jump in and that's it. We won't see them burn to death, but they're going to die. And I would be okay if the movie had done that. Because they're jumping in together, they get their little monologue, and it's what he was setting out to do. And I'm like, he's accepting death. Great. Also, they get thrown out by the volcano. I get it. It's a romantic whatever. If they were just left floating in the middle and they had there, it's always something with you, Joe. Without that little bit of this was manipulated again, I'd be like, yeah, eventually we're all going to die. Maybe not in the volcano, maybe in the water. Like, I like that angle of it. And there is some romance to that. But this movie does open like a fairy tale and it it wants to give you the fairy tale ending. And I guess that... I don't know. I, I'm not. I I like this as we're talking about it now. I like this movie more than I did, and I really that's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jar. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so next no, week we'll be talking saying. Highlander Two: The Quickening. So. <laughs> but I I absolutely get what you're saying, Tim. Because yeah, uh, it, it didn't. It didn't need that. It, I think maybe it was the Hollywood ending where we had to let the audience know that he wasn't going to die, and they they potentially have a long life ahead of them uh, with, you know, romance and happiness. But, but yeah, it's sort of, again, it's one of those things that changes how I'm thinking about the movie as a whole. Suddenly, it wasn't like this journey that he had to go on. It was something that somebody tricked him into doing. Um, and so it changes the angle a bit. Uh, if if we just knew that, like you said, that they're out there and the volcano didn't kill him, maybe the ocean will. If that doesn't, he still has the brain cloud. He'll be dead in six months. So that it does. It changes what what message we're supposed to kind of pull from it. And it's definitely a movie that's trying to tell you something. And, and in a lot of ways, it, it gives you too many other ideas, like with the firefighter portion and now this r- reveal 
it makes you it complicates it and makes you think about it in, in ways that for me again it makes it hard to connect because there's just too many angles to kind of work through can i ask one final question yes i think this is something that we're gonna ask every guest on the podcast all right which which of the meg ryan's do you think Tom Hanks should have ended up with? Well, I mean, I think the one he knows the most, even though it's compacted for movie telling and not realistically, I think it's the one that he jumps in the volcano with. If we're talking about should he end up with, he doesn't have anything in common with the first one other than they pity each other because they work at the job. I don't think he's around the red-haired one enough and he's too distracted and... It's one of those things where I think she sees from him a chance that there might be someone out there for her, but I don't think that would work. I think, and again, maybe it's the structure of the film, the blonde Meg Ryan at the end, because they go through an event together and because they share moments together, that's how you that's how you eventually end up with someone, friend or relationship or whatever, is you get that isolated moment where you're bearing your soul. And they both bear their souls in a very theatrical tidal wave sequence. So I guess the blonde one, I love the red one more, red haired one more, but I feel like the blonde one is the one that he has a connection with. I like it. I like that answer. Okay. So your team, Patricia. Oh, damn it. Bob. And now uh, Tim, go ahead and edit everything you just said uh, as my answer as well, because that was perfect. Um, it, it's really that connection that they make and the opening of the soul to each other. Um, that, uh, that does it for me, Patricia. Oh, Jeff, do you want to save your answer for your show, or do you have? No, I'm... you should. It'll be like a sequel. Everyone who's listening <laughs> to this will be able to to find out the true meaning at the end of Jarf's. Well, I th- I think you do have to listen to the podcast because I'm sure once I follow the movie minute by minute, it will change. It will probably change multiple times. But as I'm sitting here right now, I am Team DD. Who is the first one? Wow, the dark haired one? Yeah. first one. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. And why is that at this moment? They're the matches. They, they're colleagues. They've been sloughing through this terrible existence together. He's very sad and depressed. She's very shy and awkward. But what, I, what we didn't see, and I think what, what Tim's and my uh, leaning towards Patricia's show, is that he didn't get to experience... Um, or excuse me, she didn't get to experience uh, growth that we see um, Joe go through. <clears throat> and to do that, and I've been in situations in real life where I'm having experiences with um, uh, out on my own um, where like I, I had a long distance girlfriend and it was a major thing for me to have experiences uh, without her and her having experiences without me. And growing as we did separately, uh, and then never getting back together. That that's how that worked out. And so that's why for me, I find that hard, uh, hard to pick. Didi, I get what you're saying. I get that they were the match, but I think at the end, by the end of the movie, he's a different person. We don't know where she is. Plus, I just but love I look the red-haired to... one. I love red-haired Meg <laughs> Ryan. I I look forward to listening to your your minute by minute take though and and see how it changes and if it changes by the end of of your podcast. Yeah, Jeff, I know you have to get going. Bob, we'll stick, Bob and I are going to stick around and wrap a few things up. But since you do have to get going, real quick, why don't you just yeah plug what's coming up? Because again, I'm really glad you're on the show. You brought us a movie that we didn't know. We're getting a lot out of it. What's your podcast? You do now sporadically. What's the one coming up? Promote yourself real quick, and then we'll say thanks and you can head out. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. This was really fun. And the podcast that you just mentioned, occasionally I'm on a show that I co-founded with my old radio pal and former guest, Brad. That's called the Cosmic Geppetto Podcast. And that's a weekly pop culture podcast. We've interviewed a ton of musicians and authors, and we talk about everything from the Marvel movies to... And now, I didn't have in mind what was the opposite end of that scale, but we talk about geeky stuff. It's <laughs> we really talk fun. about the Marvel movies, and we talk about the marvelous Miss Maisel. <laughs> oh, that's so... You need to script my outros. <laughs> this and we'll is be having guests Tim Levins on the show next week. <laughs> no, but... 
Uh, and then coming up this fall is Joe versus the Minute. And that, <laughs> that you can follow me on Twitter, Joe versus Minute. And uh, I'm already starting to tease things about the show. And uh, then you'll be in the loop whenever we release this fall. Awesome. And we'll link that in the show notes. So if, uh, if you're listening, check out the show notes. There'll be a link to the uh, Twitter handle Jarf just mentioned. Jarf, thank you very much for, yeah, thank uh, you, sir. for being on here. Yeah, thank you both. I felt bad I, I, after... I said, you know, after he said he would have picked Dee Dee, um, and then I gave my reasons why I didn't go for that. I was like, I didn't need to do that. I should have just left it at what his choice was. But well, and otherwise, I, that, I felt no, it well. because yeah, I think it went well. Plus, it's like, well, who wants to listen to people just agreeing? That's, That's the true. thing. Like that. That's true. I was initially I was hesitant. I'm like, do I trash the movie because I didn't like it? But I'm like, nobody wants. Well, not no one. I wouldn't want to listen to a show where people are like, I love this movie. Me too. Right. <laughs> and that's the show. Yeah. So I think it went well. I think so. I, I think you and I both had problems with it. Um, so with the show? Oh, with the movie. With the movie, and and talked yeah. about those things. And I think Jarf, as a fan, was able to counter some of those. And I thought it was a good discussion. Yeah, I guess this is our segue back in. I'm probably going to use that, that part. Okay. Um, but oh yeah, it was. Uh, thank you once again, Jarf, uh, for 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 giving some time to be on the show. He had to run because he has a life outside of recording one episode with us. <laughs> but uh, Bob, I thought we would regroup real quick, just because I, I actually I kind of like this kind of segment. I would like to do it again because oh yeah, I've got a long list of things you and I have missed. Okay. I just need to find. I, I, I know, like seven years of your kids, for example. But, <laughs> but, but in regards to this, because um, it is one of those things, I, I tend to get very egotistical. That's it. Um, with <laughs> my view of pop culture, where, and I've I've gotten better with this as I got as I've gotten older, and the internet has helped and all. But I mean, I used to feel like I was on the top and the cusp of what was important and if i didn't go see it or if i didn't know it it was nothing and i know that's not true so it is always interesting that there are things that like this meant a lot to jarf and 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 his co-host on the upcoming show and, and friends of his in college and i know we talked a little bit about it but just to answer that question how did we miss this because again 14 year old me should have been all over the surrealness of the title tom hanks meg ryan those all should have been attractors to me and it sounds like for you 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 tried you yeah went it was it. like those were attractions um and i did try i didn't try right away i didn't go to see it in the theater um but uh, a couple years or so after it came out i rented it um and tried to watch it and just couldn't get into it at the beginning there. Um, for whatever reason, it's hard to say. It could be like I talked about in, in or earlier. Uh, it could be because it was sort of a slog, uh, and I wasn't prepared for that uh, at the beginning. But it's 29 I, years. You think we would have stumbled across it maybe in 29 well, years like, or abandoned it? There are so many other things that come out in that 29-year period. Um, and there are other Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan movies that honestly I would watch more often and, and repeatedly. Uh, so it's, it's not too surprising that I wouldn't get back to it. And the world at large didn't give me a lot of opportunities either. The world at large sort of put Joe versus the volcano in the background. I guess I wasn't renting romantic comedies. And again, Mm. I saw this as a romantic comedy, right? That's how it was pitched to me. And so that's how you missed it. I guess so, and which is odd because I always think like I love Annie Hall, I love When Harry Met Sally, I love Singles. I, it's a handful of romantic comedies that I kept going back to. Most of it, probably those kind of interactions I got from sitcoms. I thought I loved that romantic storyline, but I guess I didn't really pursue a lot of those because I didn't watch those by myself. And if I rented movies, I was either renting an action movie with friends 
or something by myself. And I guess I wasn't about to rent a romantic comedy. So because of how it was sold to me, even though I thought, oh, this is going to be quirky and surreal. Yeah, I just, I wasn't in a There was too many other romantic comedies for me to pick from. Right. That I guess because I saw that because of how it was promoted in the moment. Because I think they thought this is what will make money. People will go to see the Meg Ryan, Tom Hanks dichotomy. That's how I missed it. Dichotomy? I don't know what that was. That no, was that's that's a word. It's a that's word. I don't was. know. Yeah. Do I, I really do accent things odd, apparently. I like your flair, Tim. Oh, thanks. Well, thanks. And I'll tell you, if you guys like my flair, if you, the listener, like flair, maybe I'll start posting it on Instagram. How? Huh? Who's Instagram? 20 Popcast Instagram. How do I get to that? Maybe you visit the website. What's the website? Well, the segue into the... Oh, my God. Oh, my fucking God. I don't... Maybe we should have just faded out when Jeff said goodbye. That was awful. I was just trying to end it. We still have that opportunity. <laughs> to, to end it? Oh, to fade it out. That's <laughs> to fade true. it out well ahead of all of this. Well ahead of this. And what this, which is just shameless self promotion. You can visit us. We're a show. We're a show that's wrapping it up right now, 20th Century Pop. Not for good, just for this episode. And if you like this episode, if you want to hear past episodes, or even better, if you want to subscribe to the show so you get a new episode every time, every other week when a new one is released, uh, you can go to www.20popcast.com. That's the main website. Um, there we always have the most recent episode up, as well as the links to all the past episodes. I think I just said a sentence ago. You can subscribe to us there on, on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher. You know how podcasts work, so you can subscribe to us there. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, at 20 Popcast. Uh, that's the website oh my god bob you should say a lot here sure you can you can follow me my personal twitter uh rh canning yep all that and uh as always i encourage um some interaction i encourage uh you to let us know your thoughts on joe versus the volcano me Um, oh the people the people the people people at home listening on trains and bike rides uh yeah shout us out also, and here's, I, yes, and you know what I find nice? Every episode, that's your spin. You open it up for conversation. I think that's great. What is less nice is nobody responds. But, you know, yeah, that's not true. We, we, there's, it's just few and far between. That's true. So let's get some more. But, but I like I like your angle there. And what I would add to that is similar to, uh, I like this. I like this segment of people bringing stuff that means something to them that we miss. So similar to how Jarf suggested uh, the, the, the Joe versus the, 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 the volcano, um, if you're if you listener if there's something you adore from the 80s or 90s a piece of pop culture that means a lot to you that you think has gone genuinely or generally forgotten if it's something that you feel like isn't talked about in 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 the larger scheme of pop culture get in touch with us maybe we can have you on the show maybe we can talk about that i mean you don't know what we haven't seen but there's chances are that there's plenty of things we haven't is this making sense this is a weird thing to ask there's no way there's no way we could possibly have seen everything we uh, well, have talked about sense, yeah. we have talked about the fact that that the things we love we go back to and so the things mm-hmm. we miss remain missed so let us know uh, what you absolutely love and uh, it might just fit into uh, this topic so we're asking we people but we're asking people to know what we missed that's the part that we're I'm asking that people does, to, that's a weird thing to ask somebody you know what we missed they know no, no, no. we're Most asking them don't. to let us know what they love and then we can yeah. let them know if it fits this uh, how did we miss it topic so if we missed it we'll have them on the show if, and if we, we love it if we love then it then they can go yeah. to hell wow <laughs> no too strong well, I just well I think we alienated one person okay and kept the other one so that's good that's good <laughs> All right, we'll be back in two weeks with something. <sighs> oh my I God. wish you hadn't sighed. Because really? that, I was, can... that was a good ending. Yeah, cut the sigh out. We'll be back in two weeks with <laughs> something. That's perfect. Yeah, it's because it's promising, because it's yeah. perfect. Because it makes people feel like, oh, they do a show. <laughs> Basically, what I'm saying is we'll have these microphones again hooked up. <laughs> The internet won't stop being a thing. We'll still make show notes. I might as well just say next week, ah, and just make a, you know, just fart. I could fart into the mic. That's what we'll do next week. In two weeks, two weeks we'll fart. One week, ah, two weeks fart. That's that's the show schedule. That's it. <sighs> ah, I held in my laughter so you could get a nice clean break there, but that was great. I love that ending. <laughs> okay. We 
should just replay that ending on every episode. I think that we do. Nice. I feel like we do. I feel like that is, it's become routine almost it's like a bit. Routine. All right. <laughs>